welcome to Creative Mornings. The theme this month is Connect. I'm particularly looking forward to checking out all of your name tags and see what you're connected to. Um, this is where you are. <laughs> to remind you, I know it's very early. Sometimes I have to look at this slide to remind myself. I'm Erica Hall from the Old Design Studio, right around the corner. Uh, I'd like to thank all of the uh, helpers and volunteers and people who make this possible, especially uh, Jenny Chu, who records the videos that are now available on the beautiful redesigned creativemornings.com site that I really recommend you, you take a look at because they have videos from all over the world and it's, uh, it's really easy to just browse through all the talks and that's really neat. Um, Benjamin Nguyen, who as always is um, making the mimosas and uh, making sure everybody's, but yeah, he's everybody's favorite uh, person who does a lot of the work right here. Tom Carney taking photos <laughs> and uh, Whisk SF providing the food. Uh, and we know these are the food and the mimosas, a good chunk of the reason you're here. And a punch and pie. Uh, of course, I'd like to thank our host, Parasoma, who is so generous in opening your space to us. Even though it is somewhat disorienting, I know. We're in a new, weird orientation that uh, I think is working out, but I'm, you know, I'm still kind of getting my head around that too. This early morning, it's, it's difficult for me. Uh, so while the talk's going on, feel free to tweet using the hashtag SFCM so we can all uh, remember those quotable quotes. And uh, now I'd like to welcome our speaker, Nicole Hollis, who is a local interior uh, designer and founder of Nicole Hollis, a design firm. Uh, she does a lot of really interesting collaborative work with architects and artisans and uh, works with a lot of neat uh, experimental techniques and materials and things. I'm sure she's going to talk to us about those. So welcome, Nicole Hollis. Thank you, Erica. Um, uh, thank you, Mule Design, Parasoma, and Creative Mornings. Happy to be here this morning. Let me just move that out of the way. Um, thank you all for getting up so early to be here. I uh, looked this morning to see how many people were attending and I couldn't believe voluntarily how many people were getting up <laughs> to come in, so I appreciate that. Um, so the, the theme this month is connectivity and so uh, when they asked me to do the talk, I was thinking about that um, connectivity that too, um, and how we connect with our, uh, I don't know, is that too echoey? Okay. <laughs> um, and so the connections between our ideas and our designs and the relationships that we make and sort of how that all comes together. So I wanted to put that into a slide presentation to talk to you a little bit about today. So go on this ride with me and let's talk about suspending our um, daily lives and sitting down and letting our dreams come to reality. So when people meet with me and they ask me, um, what do you do? I say I'm an interior designer. And a lot of people don't know exactly what that means. It could, oh, so you pick out pillows or fabric or, I was like, yeah. And I usually just say yes, <laughs> because it's a lot easier than really getting into what interior designers do. But we imagine your interior environments and not only do we try and um, think about the practicality and the function of an interior environment, but we also want to enlighten you, um, educate you, uh, stimulate, and excite. So thinking about those things and sort of, uh, and, you know, d about discovery and, um, you know, contrasting of materials, and we start getting sort of this laboratory, um, you know, thought process in our studio. So we just start throwing materials on the table and start talking about like, what does the space feel like? And usually when we end up talking about it, it's we say, what does it want to be? So it already, com it becomes a personality. And what does this, this building wants to be, this space wants to be, and what do we want, how do we want the user to react to that space? So I would, I'm not a fine artist, but I would say you could compare that a little bit to fine art where, the artist is always thinking about the experience of the viewer and the, you know, the end result is what emotions are evoked by that work. So we'll talk a little bit about that. So that, that being said, we just kind of conjured this name, Material Alchemy. So to me, materials 
are the foundation of the work. And so we start with um, raw textures, wood, wool, metal, glass, steel, uh, you know, fabric, textiles, uh, soft, hard. Um, and these are things that we don't know how they're going to apply to the environment yet, but these are where we just start throwing these ideas out. Light, dark, you know, how do you, do you go through small space and go into a bigger space and how does that feel? Um, so, as I said, people ask, you know, where, what do you do and where do your ideas come from? And almost 100% of the time I say from nature. I'm truly inspired by nature and truly fascinated and in, in awe of what we see in nature on a daily basis, a cluster of trees, a, a, the feathers of a bird, the light and the dark, the, the contrast in, 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 you know, from close up, from far away. So nature inspires me on a daily basis and that typically comes through in my work. Um, so taking the image of nature and, con and then taking that natural environment and turning it into sort of processing it through our imaginations and coming up with this artistic piece, this beautiful dress made of feathers. So that's what I'm interested in, taking the idea of a natural element and then conjuring this fantastical piece of work that comes from that. And so that, to me, is the alchemy. A group of trees can be inspiring and the landscape, you know, or a landscape can inspire a whole color scheme for an interior. Just to shadow the light, the dark, um, taking the wood and simply just nailing it to the side of a building for a petting zoo and creating this rigorous, you know, organized um, architecture that is so simple yet so powerful. Taking paper from the tree and cutting it and with the technology, uh, so again, you transfer this old world material into a new modern um, aesthetic. So this is laser cut paper, just amazing. Snowflakes, so complicated yet incredibly simple. Um, so the snow to me, and again in nature, you find these complexities and taking these complexities on a very small scale and turning them into um, sort of an art installation from David Hammond selling the snowballs on the side of the street for money. So you, you find this everyday object and elevate it into an art form um, and, and a commodity. And then ultimately conjure in your imagination what you could do with that natural element. And so the man-made hand, you know, what we can create is limitless. I mean, obviously, we put a man on the moon. So whenever we're building something, t sometimes they'll say, it just can't be done, Nicole. And I'm like, well, we put a man on the moon. And they're like, ah, he knew you were going to say that. <laughs> um, so we try, you know, I really try and push. I try and push the boundaries of, of the materials, of, the, of, of any sort of fabricator. I try and push them. They get engaged. They get excited. They're like, yeah, we're going to make this. I don't know how yet, but we'll find a way. And that, to me, is the connection that I'm looking for. So the first material I pulled to show you today is wool. It's again, taking this amazing organic element and transforming it um, through, you know, imagination and then hard craftsmen. So, you know, age old material, um, typical, you know, knitting. And then we go into chunk it out pull the scale up larger and it becomes something unusual. So typical everyday knitting, very tiny sweater, little details, knit it larger and it, it transforms almost into an art installation. It's a picture of my daughter, by the way. This is a little hard to read, but this is um, Vitra's Panton chair. So uh, a couple of years ago, P Vitra approached me and asked me to do an installation, a collaboration with them on using their fur office furniture in a retail environment. And the charge was to make it warm and inviting. Most people think of Vitra as a office setting, a reception setting, more contract or commercial. And Vitra's like, that's not necessarily true and we need you to help us convey that to the community in San Francisco. Um, so taking this iconic chair 
and, say, and looking at it in an, in an unusual way, we're like, okay, well, this is a manufactured chair. This chair is um, mass produced, it's molded plastic, and I mean, the line is, is beautiful, but what is it? It needed a, a man made, handmade, actually, woman made, um, imperfect slipcover. So we came up with some concepting, immediately started sketching, like, it's just, it feels cold. And to Vitra, they were like, oh, people think our furniture is cold. They're like, well, we need to warm it up, so let's put a sweater on it. So <laughs> immediately thinking, like, we need to get this sweater wrapped on this chair and start chunking it out and wrapping it. And um, so first person I call is my sister, Tanya. And I'm like, can you knit me some slip covers for these chairs? And she's like, I have no idea how to knit, but I will teach myself. So she starts learning how to knit. We start sketching, figuring out how to make these. Um, we're in my studio looking at you know, different wools and yarns and how do we make it. And, of course, the installation is like a week away, and she's learning how to knit, and I, we don't know. So we're just making it happen, and um, start just experimenting with different um, wools and different materials, um, ending up with alpaca and unbleached, I mean natural, um, no color, and just really wanted to get the purest form knit these slip covers, each one is a little bit different, and then slip those on the chairs, and, and it tr transforms the chair immensely. Um, so that was sort of the, the experiment that we came up with, and that has a little tassel at the end, and uh, each one has a different tassel, and it, it, it was quite whimsical and exciting. Um, even Vitra was like, maybe we should put these in our line, because these are cute little, we call them chair cozies. To me, that's where the alchemy is, that's where the connection, where the excitement of any project is like coming up with these ideas, collaborating, experimentation, and taking these natural materials and these age-old processes and applying them in new ways. Not a lot of computers going on in this process. I mean, clearly, I'm probably a lot older than most of you, but when I started, we just drew everything by hand, no computers. We would type our memos on a typewriter. Um, but as computers became more of the process and technology is more of a daily um, process in our studio, we have AutoCAD, we have 3D drawings, but we always start sort of with the material and messing around and prototyping. And so it's so, so important that you stay connected to the, you know, the fabricators and the metal workers the you know, wood craftsmen, they've been doing this for a long time. So if I have an idea, the first thing I do is I don't know anything about wood, but I want to do this. And they're happy to tell me what I can and cannot do, or we can't do it, or I've never done it before, but let's try. Um, and that happens more if there's a one-on-one -on -one personal interaction than via email. I mean, if I can sit in front of someone and just say, I know this is crazy, but what if we did this? And they're like, oh my god, yeah, let's do it. And then we just start pulling things out and going crazy. But if I send an email and say, hey, I have this crazy idea, and they're like, maybe. You know, it just, it, there's that connection that is missed, I believe. So I have to like get in my car, go to the studio, and say, what if we did this? And they're like, OK, let's do it. Or they come to my studio, and we just start drawing. So I, I, I want to emphasize that in the creative process, those interpersonal connections and relationships. Um, and I tell the younger designers too, it applies not just to interior and architecture, but to, to, you have to just get together and then go away and do your work and come back. But getting together is, is important. This is the final installation. On the back of the uh, sofa, is a, a, also a quilt that my sister made, thank you. Um, again, just laying this handmade, like collaged material on top of a manufactured piece by the Burlech Brothers. We've transformed it and transcended into this you know, antique setting, but it's all completely modern furniture. Um, they reintroduced the, the Eames chairs at the end of the table. The table itself is um, a conference table that we just commandeered into a farm table. Uh, the wall covering on the back wall is um, Yetta Morrison. Uh, she collaborated with us and she created this wall covering. So she f takes all the um, extinct botanical, the plants of, I think they're state of New York, 
And she's taken them, digitized them, and created a wall covering that's completely new and modern, but it's, it looks like old-fashioned, old-timey wall covering, but it's totally new. Um, the chandelier, it's a little blown out, but you could see that Jason Miller has been casting these antlers in porcelain. So again, a riff on the, the original antler chandelier, but reimagined in porcelain. So very delicate. So all of these pieces have a handmade quality to them, and that, I think, is what warms up an interior. So it's not rocket science, but it, it is sort of a magical alchemy that occurs. Metal, one of my favorite materials to work with. Um, something about going to the machine shop, the smell, the like metal workers, it's kind of sexy in a way, and they're always like, Nicole, you're standing a little too close. Um, so I'm like, ah, I love that, like, they're like sweaty and they smell like metal, and it's, it's pretty cool. Um, so I'm like getting a whiff right now. So Tony at Phoenix Day. Phoenix Day are one of the uh, oldest uh, lighting manufacturers in San Francisco. I think I wrote down they are the sixth oldest running company in San Francisco, in the history of San Francisco, established in 1850. So we're digging through their, they have this room of just part, lamp parts. And I was like, there's a casting of an ostrich leg that someone used for, I was like, what is that? And I don't know what I want to use it for, but I'm going to make something out. Like, this is the craziest treasure trove I've ever been to. They also have these amazing drawings that they've laminated from their archives. So you can take their archival drawings and reimagine them in new materials or in, in new scale. Um, so they're incredibly collaborative. They do a lot of custom pieces for a lot of designers in the city. Um, so Tony and I are talking about a project where we're doing a restaurant and I start talking to him about some concepting for a light fixture that I want to make and so he and I are working on how to build it and he's like it's, the scale was really big he's not sure so he's going to talk to his guys we're going to get back together so I send him this photo like I want to make these bells but really big and in brass and he's like well we don't we do brass but the casting is really large so we had to sort of work out how to cast these large gap um, bells. So we start sketching out scale and sizes, three of them for a restaurant, um, hanging over a central table. So have, after doing some prototyping, cutting out of wood, some of the loops that we created, and sort of um, imagining shapes and sizes, then going through some prototyping processes, which is the best part, just standing in the studio and watching them create these amazing, this machinists that have been there for 40 years, pretty spectacular. Um, so here's one of the light fixtures we created for the wall. So based on an antique fixture, but very pure in form, took away all the hammering, all the detailing, all the trim, and just had a, bron a brass disc with a, a bare light bulb. And then getting to these brass lanterns with some leather strapping. This is still not fully installed. We're prototyping the the, the chain, but you can see the scale of these huge brass bells hanging over uh, the table. So again, sitting down, working out, prototyping, um, but working with these beautiful pure materials in their purest form. So wood, um, we use wood in almost every project. A lot of um, people ask me, you know, are you contemporary, are you modern, are you traditional? I'm like, I'm whatever I need to be that day. Like, I, if we start boxing ourselves into a style, then we're not exploring. So it depends on the client, it depends on the site, on the architecture. There are so many factors that affect the work that we do in my studio. So we try not to, if we start a new project, we break the mold from the last one, like, let's just try something new. So I don't want to start saying I'm a only, I do modern interiors or I only do traditional. Um, but the one thing we always use in our, in our interiors is wood. And I feel very strongly, we have very strong connections with a lot, a lot of wood dudes, as they call themselves. <laughs> and there's a guy, Joe and Ukiah, and I'm like, Joe, I need a giant log. And he's like, oh, well, what's that? He calls them sticks. He's like, I've got this stick, it's about 30 feet long. And I'm like, awesome, you know, send me pictures. So, I mean, literally that's how it happens. Like you can't, 
you can't Google like 30 foot long log. Like it just doesn't, you have to like go to long, the lo you know, go out in the middle of the lumber yard and start looking and touching and feeling. So that the tactile sort of, you know, the visual, but also the sensual of like touching the wood and feeling the wood. Is it rough? Is it smooth? Is it light? Is it dark? Is it old? Most of our wood that we use is reclaimed and old. They're just so beautiful. There's so much great stuff out there. So this is like what I like. I like to get out of the office and get out there and say, you know, that's what I want. And I don't know what I want it for, but I'm going to do something with it. And there are so many people that specialize in pulling wood, you know, trees. At, they're fallen logs up in the forest. They're pulling them out and they're milling them. They're slabbing them. They're drying them for two years so that we can start making furniture out of them. And so it happens a lot. So for a winery in Napa Valley, um, they have a historical barn on their property. It was a distillery, and it's one of the oldest buildings in Napa Valley. And they said, well, we need a 43-foot-long table. And I was like, easy. Uh, <laughs> too easy. Let's make it hard. Let's get a log that we can use as the dining table. And presenting to the, the board of people that don't even live in Napa Valley, they live in Texas, and I'm like, I want to make this big tree log table thing that, you know, and they're just like, sounds totally crazy, let's do it. I'm like, great. So then I start calling all my wood guys. Hey guys, I got approval, I'm going to do this log table, it's going to be like 45 feet long, it's going to be cool, I'm going to cut it in half. They're like, no way, you can't do that. Nope, doesn't happen. Tree will twist, it'll turn, the, the climate change, it'll start tweaking. There's no way you can make a table out of that. Just hang up the phone. You know, everyone in my studio, they're all, we're all calling, we're all getting like crazy, psycho, not happening. So all our wood guys who love working with are, are, tell, are sending us away. No, not gonna happen, sorry. And I'm like, really? Like, I wanna make this table? This is a quick sketch of it. And I'm like, you know, slice the lot. They're like, no. And instead of just changing tack and just like coming up with another design, just, I don't know why, I, resist, I dug my heels in, I'm like, we're gonna make this bloody table. So John Hauschman in New York um, has worked with us on, he does a lot of wood pieces and sort of on the verge of sculpture. And he and I worked together on, a, on another project and I, so I emailed John and I'm like, hey, I know I talked, whenever I call John, it's like, can we make a beaded African chair, but reimagined with, we, he's like, I know this guy, he's got a warehouse down on the South Street Seaport, and if he opens a garage, there's like all these beads, and I'm like, I'm there. So he gets it, so I'm like, okay, we're gonna do this crazy log table. He's like, I've looked everywhere, I can't find a tree soft enough, even if we do it, and carve the tree out, and reinforce it in steel, we had this plan to like reinforce the interior of the tree, he said it still could possibly explode. I was like, that's probably not a good idea for you know, a table of 40 sitting there and the tree explodes. So I'm like, what do we do? So he said, listen, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna make the, the tree, the log, out of reclaimed pieces. I'm gonna take pieces apart, take trees apart, and, and make a reinforced log, and then take all the bark off of the trees and add it to this log. So this log has about four or five different species of bark applied to it. So it is a, a fabricated log after all, which is goes against my no fake thing, but I reluctantly agreed and it worked out beautifully. And then the ends are huge slabs of poplar. So you found some poplar slabs at the ends to be the real wood and then all these guys in a warehouse upstate New York are gluing on bark to a log tree. Um, and it was just a, an amazing process. Um, you know, he's like, Jesus, Nicole, really? So you could see this photo, and there's a lot of bark, and it's all meticulously being applied back, so to look like a real tree. Then they split the tree in half, and then book matched the ends so that we could have double the length. So that was the concept. So that's John. And I think that's his mom, I hope, or his wife, I don't know. <laughs> don't want to say anything. That's why I agreed not to say anything. And then um, you can see the tree, so we have the steel base and the glass. So basically you dine on the glass part so that you're viewing the tree as the centerpiece, but you're not actually physically dining on the tree. Um, so this is part two, is how do we get the tree from New York to San Francisco? <laughs> 
and how do we get it from the truck into the barn. Um, so that took months of coordination. They had to do mock installations of, in New York. They finally get to us and say, okay, we did it. We, this is what we require, two forklifts and 18 men. After trying to use a lot of equipment and mechanicals, we figured it's all about manpower. So we're calling all our movers, and most people are like, no, we don't want to move this tree. But we finally found our movers, and they agreed. <clears throat> so the, the truck arrives from New York, and we orchestrate the move, and this is one half of the two. And the heaviest part were the plate steel bases, because it was like a ton of steel. Um, so getting these guys to move the tree in safely, and then me taking all the credit for their hard work. Um, so there we are inspecting half of the tree, and then trying to get it off of the lifts, you know, into the room without damaging this beautiful specimen. Um, and then finally installing it into the space. So from crazy concept to installation, you can see like, it, the journey is what it's about. And, and typically I'm pretty flexible and I will abandon an idea, but I just wouldn't give this one up because I just felt like in this barn building, this tree was the perfect solution um, for the interior. So we haven't put the chairs around it yet or anything, but that kind of summarizes not just the manpower, but the relationships and the connections and the concepting and the ideas and just being able to allow yourself to imagine and dream it and it does actually happen. So it's, I, it's so rewarding in our work. Um, you can see in the little corner, John signed the bottom of the, of the tree and there, and there we are, there's our alchemy. So again, just reimagining materials in a new way and that emergence of where I feel like as a designer, we stand at the threshold of art, fashion, craft, design. We kind of cull from every single one and, uh, and try and apply that. So I, I feel like working with all of these fabricators and artists and, um, and then again, just you know, this image embodies that. What is the view, the end viewer? What's their experience, and how does it trigger an emotional response or emotional reaction to their environment, or to the work, or to, you know, to the the piece of furniture? Um, so I think that you can see, like everyday materials used in a new way can be transcending. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Nicole. That was, that was really great. So does anybody have any questions? Anyone? Uh, there, in the back row there. Okay, so to repeat the question for everybody and, and for the video, uh, since you talked about the other respect here for the craftsmen, uh, with all these people saying this can't be done, um, why did you like per pursue that idea um, rather than like asking them or looking for other ideas? Great question. Thanks. Yes. Yes, we did ask them. You know, can it be done? Would how would you do it? Um, it's clearly, we're not wood experts. We just know what the, the concept is, what the reality of the situation. But, you know, I don't pretend to know what wood will do, especially over time. And wood is a very fickle beast, as we all know. So even, even the most experienced ex wood expert, uh, we've made table, we've found a tree, a, um, a black walnut tree that was uprooting a man's house. And he said, if you, we don't cut this tree down, it's gonna become a historical treasure <laughs> and it's tearing my house down. So he had like a month. So the wood guy's like, I'm gonna cut it. Do you want it? I want it. Let's dry it. So we drew, he slabbed it, dry it for two years, installed it as a, a five foot wide table, perfectly beautiful slab, still starting to move around. I mean, it just wood does what it wants. So yeah, these are all guys I work with a lot. And, and they know me, and so they were just like, we really want to do this, but we just, we know that wood will not do this. And so I should have just said, okay, we're gonna do something else. But, um, so then, you know, we went into the fabricated, but absolutely, I always ask them. 
in any work that we do with any craft or any trade, they do what they do all day long. I don't pretend to tell them how to do their job. So I just say, when I walk on a job site and the carpenter is working in the room, I don't tell him what to do. He knows how to do it. I just tell him what, what we want as designers, what we want to achieve. And if it's something that he's never done before, it is my job to motivate him, to excite him, to show him that it's been done before by maybe finding examples or imagery. Um, we talk about using 3D printing to print something, to you know, show a, a scale model, to show the craftsmen. So I think you know, our job is definitely cheerleader. And uh, you know, we have, we're part sales. We have to sell it to the client. Here's a crazy idea, and we want you to pay for it. And then sell it to the fabricator and say, we want you to make it. And if it doesn't work, it's all my fault, which is always, that's part of the risk. Um, so yeah, we, you know. I appreciate that question because I, I definitely look to them as experts. Hey, um, I wanted to just hear how you pick your clients because um, that whole story of, um, of how many million man hours were involved in that project, that's a hard sell, I would imagine, to a lot of people. So you must have picked good clients and good clients pick you. I wanted to hear yeah. if that's the question uh, is, how do I pick my clients or how do they choose me? Um, and, and that's a great question. I mean, you could, our portfolio is, very, is varied from project to project. So the styles, the look, the feel, it varies um, from the client, from the location, and the architect, and the architecture. Um, so, so based on that, we do an interview process with our clients and we tell them, you know, this is what we're about. This is what I believe in. I want to experiment and push the limits and the boundaries and create beautiful design. I understand that schedule is a real issue. Budget is an issue. So we have candid conversations about that. Um, but I do have clients that say, I've seen what you've done, and I think it's totally crazy. And I want, you, I want a little bit of crazy in my house. Not a lot. We'll give you like one room or one concept or one idea. So there's always one thing that we, we try and, and it's not crazy. It's just not been done before, or it's ambitious, or it's something that, that we have repeat discussions about and really educate them. But the easy, once we get the client signed on, or at least to the concept, my next step is to get them to meet the fabricator. It's almost like going on a studio visit to meet the artist. When you engage an artist and you see their work and it speaks to you, immediately you're like, I want to maybe own a piece, but it's really expensive. And that is with a, de a designer as well. So once you meet the designer and you come to their studio or my studio and we show you the work that we're doing, then the client's like, oh, I kind of I feel more comfortable because I see process. It's easy to show a beautiful photo, but they have to understand process, how we work together, how we rein in budgets. You know, we, they gave me a budget for this table, and I was like, okay, I have to beat this budget. So with John, we value engineered this table, and we beat the, the dollar amount that they gave us to make it. Um, but I also had to sell the idea that that table was an art piece, and it required an art budget, not a furniture budget. <laughs> Um, so that's also, you know, kind of salesy, but it's what we have to do. Um, we're doing a cast bronze screen for a client, and it's a big com financial commitment. But flying the client to New York to meet the artist that's casting the bronze and looking at prototypes in, in her studio, which is like, you know, in Soho, you know, beautiful double height loft. It all is all part of the experience to them. So when they are sitting in their dining room looking at the screen, it's not just something that they bought from a gallery or online. It was, it was they're part of the process. They're part of the decision making. They're part of the you know mocking it up, and we look at the color together. And I think that is incredibly meaningful. So again, it's about those connections. Um, I hope I answered your question. Yeah. <laughs> The tree itself. Um, um, how much was the tea, the tree project? I don't. I haven't calculated design hours 
um, that we've spent on the tree um, broken out. Uh, the budget for the tree was, God, I think it was like 70,000 and we did it for 50 and then shipping and installation was probably another, you know, five grand. So, um, but then there's design time on top of that that we haven't calculated or broken out. Any um, you were talking a lot about like, technology and not necessarily you're looking online to find this thirty foot long tree. Um, but how do you find your artisans that you work with? Um, you know, you work with a plethora of different artisans, obviously all around the country. What are those relationships like, and sort of how do you? That's a great question. How do I um, meet artisans and find them? Um, Internet, yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, but you know, art blogs or you know, magazines, um, friends. You know, sometimes I'm just like, hey, guy, I want to make this glass thing, and they're like, oh, I know this dude who blows glass. So there's a lot of that that goes on, a lot more than probably should. But um, there's, you know, or I'll meet someone, and they will be the sort of the secret ingredient that. So I'll meet someone, and he says, oh, I make custom made, you know, fur hammocks. And I'm like, well, I need a fur hammock. I don't know where. <laughs> so the project gets designed around that guy's work. So sometimes I'll meet the artist first. And if they don't work for one project, I, I kind of roll a dex. Oh, no one uses that word anymore. I'll file them away. Um, so yeah, I, I sort of keep them in mind and I stalk them a little bit. Like if I meet an artist I really love and I think that their work is great and I can't afford it and I'll try and like, well, I have this project, but this is only my budget and I, I want a little tiny piece of what you do. And so we try and collaborate. So I think um, as much as I, my firm name is my name, it's so much about collaboration with the designers that work in my studio and with the fabrications and artists. Same with architects, I stalk architects too. The frontiers of design, my aspirations for the next five or 10 years. Um, good question. I have so many aspirations. And uh, daily, it's like herding cats in my head. But um, right now, we're, we're developing a home furnishings line. So again, taking some of that experimentation and collaboration and putting it into something that's a little more ready, readily accessible. Um, not just to my specific clientele, but to a wider net of people. So finding that, stalking that artist and collaborating on a piece with them and then putting it in the line and sort of creating maybe, you know, five or ten of those. And once they sell out, they're gone. But sort of limited edition collaborations. So that's an aspiration as well. In my design, it's again just it really is about finding those great projects and collaborating with great architects. So I do, I kind of seek out architecture and I find great architects and then I call them and I'm like, hey, I'm in tier design, I want to work with you. And they're like, who are you? Like, why are you calling me? But that's how it starts. So I, I really do try and seek out great work and then match ourselves with their great work. And if we collaborate from the very beginning, typically the projects are seamless. Like you don't notice what is the line between architecture and interiors because we're all talking about all of it at the same time. And for me, I like, I want to aspire to more of that than to separate the two and say, the architect's like, well, I've done the shell, here you do the interiors. Like we, I want to make sure that there's seamless design going on in collaboration. Um, so yeah, just, you know, I aspire to inspire the younger generation of designers in my studio and have them, you know, elevated and to learn. But I want to make sure that it's like based in the foundations of these old craft, old world, because uh, these things, they need to survive. The artists need to survive. The craftsmen need to survive. And it's our job to usher them into this 21st century. So I feel a, a strong responsibility to to educate the client on the value of these old world traditions. You know, there, there's like, uh, real quick, there, Venini in, in Italy, they blow the most beautiful Venetian glass you've ever seen. But nobody is, um, what's the, 
interning, or nobody is learning how to, apprenticing, no one's learning how to blow that glass. After these three guys leave, they don't know if they'll be able to make this glass anymore because the younger generation is not interested in standing in a furnace for 20 hours a day, like really hot and dangerous conditions. Um, so there's real concern, real serious concern for some of these old world traditions. So we have time okay, for one, one more. more. One more. Clear always aspired to do, um, strangely driven, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, growing up in Florida, um, we sort of grew up on the, on the funky side of town where there's Palm Beach and Jupiter Island and very fancy mansions that our friends, parents, my sister's right here, that's why I keep looking at her, our friends' parents would work in these houses, so we would have access to this amazing architecture and design, which I didn't grow up in, but I grew up around. And, um, you know, having gone to New York every year, a couple of years, being inspired by fashion as well. So I just knew I wanted to do something that had a little more impact and longevity than fashion design, which I was also interested in. And so um, studying interior design just kind of made sense to me. So my, I was driven. So I went to New York and I got a job at architecture firm and studied at FIT and started training under architects and working from there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Before, uh, yeah, that was, uh, that was uh, really neat. Thanks so much for getting up so very early, and all of you as well. Uh, thanks again for coming out. And please watch uh, our Twitter account, San Francisco underscore CM, for announcements of future events. We'll see you next time. Uh, thanks again to Parasoma. And Whisk SF and all of the other people, and please take your cups and things as you leave and dispose of them. Thank you. See you next time.